Bones are part of our skeletal system, and now bone is going to be stronger than cartilage because it is going to have an extracellular matrix that is very sturdy and rigid. And this is due to different deposits of minerals, so like calcium and phosphorus, that give it its calcification, giving it its strength. Bones are going to be organs that are made up of all four tissue types. So bones are made up of connective tissue, nervous tissue, muscle tissue, as well as epithelial. However, the predominant one will be connective tissue. So some of the functions of bone include support and protection. So bones are going to support and protect our vital organs. Our skull, for example, is protecting our brain. Our thoracic cavity is protecting our lungs and heart. Also function is movement. So our muscles and our bones are going to work together in order to move. One can't go, one can't do it without the other. The next function is hemiopoiesis. Here we have the production of red blood cells and this is happening within our uh, cavities, the bone marrow. And then lastly, storage of minerals and energy reserves in the form of fat. So we have two different types of bone marrow. Red is going to be for blood. Yellow is going to be for minerals and for energy. And so we'll have storage of fat. But other minerals include calcium, phosphorus, and zinc as well. So we classify our bones based on their shape. So the first one, long bones. These bones are going to be a greater in length than in width. So an example of this would be our femur or our thigh bone. Another example or classification is short bone. And so these are going to be nearly equal in length as in width. An example of this would be within the foot and so our tarsal bone. Next one is a flat bone. And these are going to have thin surfaces. So we only have these in a couple areas, for example, like the frontal bone of our skull. And then the last classification by shape is an irregular bone where it has a complex shape that doesn't fit into any of the three previous categories. And so an example would be the vertebrae. Now, another one that we have too is going to be the sesamoid bone. And so this is only within the knee and it's, or the N is the patella, so it has a sesamoid shape to it. When we take a look at a long bone, there are some characteristics that all of these share. So the first thing let's look at is the diaphysis right here, commonly known as the shaft of the bone. And in this example, the diaphysis is from here to here. Okay, and this is going to be the elongated cylindrical shaft. And here what we'll find is going to be the medullary cavity within the diaphysis. The medullary cavity is going to be the hollow portion. And in adults, this is where we find the yellow bone marrow where we'll have storage of different lipids and of minerals. However, in young children, this is going to be red in production of red blood cells. The next region, the metaphysis, is going to be the region between the diaphysis and the epiphysis. So this is the middle region that we have. And here we find the epiphyseal growth plate. And this is where bones are going to continue to grow until they have, or until individuals have hit their full adult stage. In males, this tends to be around 17 or 18 in age. Females can be as early as 14 to 16. So bones are going to grow then at the direction towards the ends. And so at the metaphysis, that's where that is occurring. All right, then the last region that we find within a long bone is going to be the epiphysis. And these are going to be the ends of bones. And we have either proximal or distal depending on the bone. And again, remember in anatomical position. And so this is where we'll have knobby and enlarged regions at each end. And these are going to help strengthen joints because they are act as attachment sites for different tendons and for ligaments. 
And lastly, what we have at the epiphysis is going to be the articular cartilage. And so the articular cartilage then is going to be a thin layer of hyaline cartilage that's going to cover that whole epiphysis and it helps to reduce friction and absorb shock at movable joints. So people with arthritis typically have a decreased amount of this articular cartilage and then so that's when you have bone on bone rubbing and it's very painful when that occurs. All right, two other structures that we find within long bones are going to be the endosteum and the periosteum. Let's begin by looking at the endosteum, and this is going to be the internal layer of the bone. Endo means internal, okay? So here it's going to cover most of the internal surface of bones, and within the endosteum, we're going to find now the, progen the cells of bones. And so examples are the osteoprogenitor cells, osteoblasts, and osteoclasts. We'll go into what those are in a little bit. Okay, the periosteum now is going to be the outer portion. So think of it as the perimeter of the bone, okay? Here now we find dense irregular connective tissue, so helping give it its strength in pulling in multiple directions. And again, this is going to cover the external surface of bone, except for where there is articular cartilage, okay? So where we have articular cartilage, which again was where we have bone meeting bone, we won't find another layer of cartilage, okay? So the periosteum will be in those regions that don't have it. And the importance of it here is that it helps to anchor the bone matrix to each other. And so also helps to anchor things like blood vessels and nerves as well within the bone. So hence all the different tissue types that we find. Lastly, this is going to have different types of cells as well. And we have the stem cells of bones as well as those that form the extracellular matrix. So both the endosteum and the periosteum have cells of the bone. There are four main types of bone cells that we have. Let's start with the first one, osteoprogenitor cells. These are going to be our stem cells that are found again within the endosteum and periosteum of long bones. And these can produce more stem cells or they can go on and then produce the second type of cell which are osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are important because these are our immature bone cells that form the bone matrix. So help to give it those protein fibers that will be responsible for that strength. From these immature bone cells of the osteoblast, what they turn into are osteocytes, which are going to be our mature bone cells. And these are going to be found in those spaces of the lacunae. And here we'll have the maintenance of the extracellular matrix, and these also help to detect different mechanical stressors that are found within bone. And from that then, they can release different minerals. So for instance, if you have an, an injury to a bone or some type of uh, weakness, then there will be an increase in calcium that will be released to help to make that bone stronger. All right, the last type that we have are going to be these osteoclasts. And these are going to be very large and have lots of different nuclei within them. And what they do is that when there are bone cells that have been decayed or have died off, they're going to dissolve the matrix. And so what they do is release calcium. For instance, when people are with aging or with arthritis or some type of bone condition. What we have is that there is an increase in response of the osteoclast. So they are breaking down faster, the bone faster than what the cells can produce. And so that's when we have brittle bones. Also within long bones, we have two different types of bone. We have either spongy bone or we have compact bone. Spongy bone is also known as trabecular bone, and then compact bone is also known as cortical bone. So compact bone, 
or cortical bone, has a solid and relatively dense appearance to it, and the external surfaces of long and flat bones is where we would find them. So here in this example, on the external surface is where we'd find that. And when we look at the microscope, it has this neat arrangement that kind of looks like uh, tree rings, okay? But they're very packed in tightly together and very little extracellular matrix. Versus now spongy bone or trabecular bone, this now has this lattice-like appearance to it, so very porous, and also, the in, this is what's going to make up the internal surface of bone. And big reason here is because it helps with the hemiopoiesis, production of red blood cells. And so those cells then can diffuse out and penetrate out of bone. A unique feature of our flat bones within our skull are going to be this dipole. And within this dipole, what we have are two layers of compact bone with a spongy bone sandwiched in between. So here we have our compact bone, compact bone, and then here is that porous spongy bone. So again, only within the bones of the skull do we find this. The basic structural and functional unit of a mature compact bone is going to be the osteon. All right, so the osteon is also known as the haversion system. So these are going to be interchangeable. All right, so the cylindrical structures are going to run parallel to the diaphysis, okay? And here what we'll find is the central canal. And the central canal is going to be at the center of each osteon. And so here's example, central canal. And this is where we'll find blood vessels and nerves. All right, so two different tissue types. We'll have now smooth muscle for blood vessels and now nerves with our nervous tissue. The rings that we find around each of the central canals are going to be called these concentric lamellae because they look like little plates that are forming around that central canal. And within the concentric lamellae, what we find are those osteocytes. And the osteocytes, again, are going to be our mature bone cells. And they are going to be found within those spaces called the lacuna. Okay, so here, for example, that blue that we see is going to be the lacuna. And then the osteocyte is going to be here in the red. Again, finding these circulating in those concentric lamellae around that central canal. And then for each of our lacuna that have the osteocytes, what we find are going to be like, looks like uh, spider legs, okay? And so what these are, these are going to be tiny interconnecting channels that are found within the bone and that extend from one lacunae to another importance here is that it helps with diffusion of materials need to go where it and for communication between different osteocytes. All right, so these are called the canaliculi. Okay, so they are little channels that are going to connect osteocytes to one another. All right, so where the, the central canals ran the parallel to the diaphysis, now perpendicular are going to be the perforating canals. So these are going to make like the horizontal H shape that we find with all the blood vessels, okay? And so these perforating canals are going to run perpendicular and help connect central canals and very important for difference of uh, materials, right? And so this is going to be passageway for both blood vessels and nerves. So that's why it's very painful if you fracture your bone because you have blood vessels and nerves running in all directions. All right, so around the entire bone, what we find is the circumferential lamellae. And these are going to be rings of bones that are going to be found immediately internal to the periosteum or internal to the endosteum, depending on where its location is. And so this will run the entire circumference of the bone. Spongy bone 
has a little bit easier microscopic anatomy compared to that compact bone. So what we have are parallel lamellae, and within the parallel lamellae, what we find are the different cells. So we'll have our osteoclasts or osteocytes, which are still going to be housed in lacunae. The lacunae are, will also have the caniculi, which are going to be, again, those spider-like extensions, okay, from one osteocyte or one lacunae to the next. And so these parallel lamellae are going to be found then within the trabeculi of the spongy bone. And again, the appearance of it is that it is very po more porous compared to that of compact bone. 